Welcome back, Dan. You are the uh, first repeat guest on the podcast. Excellent. I'm not even a working journalist. <laughs> uh, so last episode that you and I talked, we talked at a pretty high level about AI and the uh, disruption it was going to cause for many industries, but journalism specifically. And yeah, we... so today is going to be all about landing that plane exactly. and really giving folks examples uh, right. of how it's being used in the field today. And some practical tips if you're wanting to get started. Uh, so you've been working uh, with businesses on AI for a while now. You've had a, a master class you did with the city of Miami and Dade County that I attended, which was a fabulous class. And you've, uh, you're doing fractional CMO and help uh, services and helping companies apply AI. But you've also kept a foot in the journalism world. You've been working with emerging journalist ICFJ and others. And uh, I believe just this weekend, you're going to Puerto Rico to, to talk with uh, some journalists about AI. You can tell us a little bit about what's on tap there. Yeah, thank you. So um, I've been developing a real expertise in how to use AI for marketing and sales, whether you're a business or a nonprofit or a media organization. And, you know, because I have uh, nearly two decades of experience having worked in print and broadcast, uh, naturally, I am sharing some of this with uh, folks in the journalism spaces. International Center for Journalism, ICFJ, has brought me in as a trainer there. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking this Saturday uh, as a keynote speaker, uh, talking about AI as a journalism tool to 80 uh, student journalists at the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, we're going to be giving um, a really nice set of examples, some of which we'll actually cover today, about how to think about and use AI as a working journalist, whether you are the kind of reporter entry level doing the groundwork of journalism or whether you're a newsroom leader who's trying to figure out how can I use this effectively, responsibly, ethically inside of my newsroom. Great. And so I think a good jumping off point, uh, you and I have been talking about practical uses of AI for in the in local news several times actually in the past couple of weeks, but uh, you just got off a call that AP did on real world use cases for AI. I was listening in while I was buried in a spreadsheet, so only half paying attention, but uh, I think you uh, got a lot out of that. So why don't you kind of summarize uh, some, 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 tell us about some of the practical examples you got out of that, and then maybe we can uh, end with uh, some takeaways that you've picked up from that. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> yeah, the AP uh, has a project that every working journalist should be paying a lot of attention to called Local News AI. And if you just Google Associated Press AI, they have a really wonderful website where they describe what I'm about to sh share with you. Uh, it's funded by the Knight Foundation, uh, and it includes work with the Northwestern University, Medill Knight Lab, and, and Professor Army Gilbert. And pretty much all five of the examples that I'm going to run through are all trying to use intelligent automation or AI-powered automation to save journalists' time or to solve kind of a, th a thorny problem within a newsroom. And all of them are intended to be scalable solutions. In other words, solutions that while they're testing them in one local newsroom, whether it's a local TV station, a local newspaper, uh, a local radio station, their common problems uh, or challenges or time consuming tasks for any local newsroom. And um, I'm going to actually start with the one that I liked the best is from the Brainerd Dispatch in Minnesota. And because it actually is something I used to do. So when I was a, a starting journalist in 2000 at the Miami Herald, hired to cover the local neighbors section, one of my jobs every week, uh, twice a week, I should say, was to go to the local police station for the three covered and look at the police blotter reports. Mm -hmm. And I would, I mean, back in the day, I would hand write 
what was in the blotter reports because they did not allow me to make photocopies or they charged me, you know, five dollars per photocopy. And, you know, most of the reports were completely irrelevant, but really significant. And I utterly hated this task <laughs> and I was required to do it because it was the number one most part of our whole paper. I did this for many, many months, for several years, actually. And I remember um, I went to, an, I, I had to fill in for another local reporter uh, named Drager Martinez. Drager, if you hear this, please reach out. It's been many years. And poor Drager had been doing this for five years. And every time you go there, there was like a little log of his name every time he visited. And I literally had to sift through 25 pages of Drager Martinez. Like nobody else had been there in, <laughs> in five years but him. Uh, and then put my name at the bottom of that list. And it just, it really made me hate being a journalist. It really made me <laughs> not want to have a career in this field. And the Brainerd Dispatch is testing a system where they automate this process. So the first thing it does uh, is it ingests from the city uh, the public safety incidents. And then one of the really cool things that it does is it, you know, these are, um, PDFs are being distributed on, um, you know, these are public records, so they're being distributed on the police's website. So they take the PDF, scrape the data, input it in a, a spreadsheet, uh, you know, or, a, you know, a database. And then what's really cool is they developed an algorithm to um, rank what is most likely going to be something that you use, uh, that you would want to publish. So there were certain keywords and certain news um, judgments that you would make that they then programmed into the AI. And so the AI would tell you these are the most likely versus least likely, you know, cat ignore, you know, violent crime, definitely mention. And then it would um, summarize the incident in a little paragraph and then input it into the website uh, CMS for a reporter to then review and publish. So there were, the, the, the reporter stepped in in two places. The first is anything that got put into the CMS, the reporter put a checkbox next to. So even though the, the, the AI was like ingesting the information and putting it on a, a, a spreadsheet, they still had to check yes to import it. And then once it was imported, those summaries were edited before they were published. So that was one of my favorite examples, uh, really concrete, really clear uh, use case that, you know, the public loves it, but, you know, saving hours and hours of time that then that reporter could use. Uh, the reporter talked about how he could then invest that time in going deeper into some of these incidents. So rather than just like going and doing it manually, like I used to do, if there was something really interesting, he'd make that second call, poured it out, and then they would write a bigger story. And, and, that statement right there is really one of the takeaways, I think, from that, because we saw that in several examples of how reporters and, and editors were using AI to free up time to do the more impactful, the more important, the more analytical uh, jobs that the journalists could do. Uh, is that summarize one of your takeaways? Yeah, you know, it's a time saving tool. Um, right. It's very difficult. One of the big takeaways for me was that it's very difficult to build these automations um, because not only do you have to build the automation, you know, with all the integrations with various systems and, you know, AI doing a very variety of micro tasks that add up to a larger task, but then it breaks, right? Like if the police department updates their website in a small way, it could break the API that's pulling in the data. And so this whole concept of what they call DevOps or developer operations, development operations, you know, you have to not only fund the creation of it, but the maintenance of it. And they said that many of these things, even though they were built well, were breaking on an almost daily basis uh, in small ways. And you have to have somebody who's staffed to do that. So it's, it's expensive and time consuming to build it. But once it's built, it, it allows, it, this is not intended in, in any of these cases to replace a reporter. Rather, it's intended to do an but repeatable task that newspapers, the outlets, local media outlets are expected to do. 
and do those more efficiently to free up the human capital of reporters to do higher value tasks. And one of the things that is the highest value task of a journalist is human detail, interviewing human beings and getting right. information. So if it's written down in a police report, great. You know, let's let AI handle it. You know, those police reports, if you ever read a police report, are jargonly, jargony and terribly written and miss a lot of important detail that brings a story to life. So that's where the reporting comes in. And that's a good use of a reporter's to do that reporting to bring the story to life and to add the context that no blotter, uh, police blotter item will ever have. But might as well, like, not have, you know, me spend years of my life, you know, manually writing down these items um that's not a high use of my time and that would then free me up to do higher value tasks and that's really i think the spirit behind all of these projects absolutely uh what other examples stuck out to you um you know i'm going to be going to puerto rico and i live in south florida in the in the tropical climate i live in miami so the one that another one that really jumped at me was uh, el vocero uh, in puerto rico which is you know one of the spanish language publications uh, they have a problem, which is every three hours, you know, they're in the middle of like like we are in Miami, you know, the hurricane zone. And so the National Weather Service and Hurricane National Hurricane Center reports need to be um, published and potentially news alerts need to be sent to people. And this can save lives. Right. The, the this notice of a couple hours can make a real difference between uh, a life saved and not. So the problem is that these alerts are written in English. And then the National Weather Service has a Puerto Rico office with translators, but they don't translate the alerts right away. So what was happening is every three hours, they would issue a set of alerts in English. And then basically the translators got to it when they got to it. And so what happened is the paper was just sitting there on the website, refreshing the page. When the new alerts came in, they just manually translated it themselves. And so this occupied every three hours, you know, half an hour of someone's time, they would then send out an alert manually. So what they did is they created a system to ingest these, translate them, and then draft a, uh, an alert that then the reporter could just hit send on. Um, very interesting, all sorts of problems. So one of the things that I found really interesting, you know, as a Spanish speaker, is that it was translating it into, first of all, Spanish is very flowery. Um, and uh, we say things in Spanish differently than we do in English. And so um, a lot of times the translators were just non at it. And then a lot of times they were using the Spain Spanish idiom. And Spain Spanish is as different from mainland, um, you know, Latin American Spanish, which is what most of these folks um, in, in Puerto Rico speak uh, as, you know, British English is to American English. And so... Uh, it was just like it was accented, if you will, uh, with, mm -hmm. a, with, a, with Spanish words, uh, Spain Spanish words that just didn't resonate with the audience. So all that had to be fixed, um, you know, it, but in the end, a really powerful example of the potential life saving. Um, it also, you know, just saved a, a lot of time um, and made it a much more efficient process than having to do it all manually. So that was another one that. Um, I thought it has a lot, lot of, you, you know, usability. One of the interesting things is they had two sources of data, National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center. And the data from the National Hurricane Center wasn't structured in a way that allowed it to be used for this project. So they basically had to only do National Weather Service. So they're now working with the National Hurricane Center, asking them to structure the data better so that it's easier for them to use. So that was another one that I thought was really cool. Um, another one that is probably got to me the biggest impact potentially for every community in this country is um, creating transcripts from public meetings and then building summaries of those. Now, why do I think this is so important? Because what has happened in local media is as local communities have have, as local news organizations have had to cut back, one of the first places they're cutting back is coverage of, of town hall, of the little municipalities. And if you can create a way to, but most of those town hall meetings are recorded uh, and those recordings are publicly available. 
So if you could create a system like they did in Michigan, uh, Michigan um, Radio to uh, WUOM FM to ingest those um, videos, get transcriptions of them, get summaries of them, and then publish those summaries, you can um, have an incredible public service. And it's so scalable. Uh, and, you know, they talk sometimes about news brownouts or blackouts. And the idea of a news brownout is that there's no one in the hall. So to yeah. me, this is like at the core of local news. And just really quickly, a couple of things that really stood out to me. Number one, they didn't even get to do the summaries because the transcripts were really bad. Now, these are multi-year projects. I think that these are, most of these projects have been going on for two years. So a lot of the technology is pre-GPT-4. So they were using mostly GPT 3.5 and the transcripts that they were getting, um, I, I think they were using a Google tra cloud translation service and then they had to switch because it was 50% mistake rate uh, on the transcripts. So the tra transcripts were really problematic. They were able to get that down uh, to I think uh, less than 20%. And then once you have a decent transcript, then they could have started summarizing it, but it took two years just to figure out that piece. And so they never got to the summarization so, you know, still very early days and a lot of major hurdles, but you can imagine the kind of service that that would be to be able to have those public uh, meetings um, transcribed and summarized. And one of the challenges, of course, is when you do get to the summarization phase, phase which they haven't gotten to, what's the important information that you should put at the top of the summary? How do you, when you have a five hour meeting, how do you determine, you know, what is important? It's, that's a tough task for AI. Yeah, absolutely. And transcriptions as well as translation is one of the one of the areas that I've been plugged into for a while and the field has advanced so much and so quickly in the last few years. So, you know, I mean, we've had a tool like Dragon Dictation for a while and, you know, everybody knows how crappy some, sometimes Siri could be with translation. Um, and as a someone who did a lot of long form pieces, you know, I was always looking for the Holy Grail of something that would give me a good transcription. Um, you know, IBM was an early mover. Trent came along and it was OK. That was one of the tools they talked about. Uh, but it's gotten so good lately. Uh, and there are so many tools you can plug them into, you know, Zoom now with uh, Otter AI, although I think Fathom's a little better. And, and so the applications are just across the board and to be able to, you know, since the pandemic, especially more and more city council, school boards and others are putting their meeting online and to be able to quickly transcribe that, get the automated summary and then have reporters go in there and see what's worth digging into uh, is going to be a huge service uh, for the field. Yeah. Um, everything I've described so completely agree with what you said, like the technology is moving really fast and you can see that even over the years that these projects have been worked on, the technology was really rudimentary even two years ago, like the speed with which these improvements are coming is breathtaking. I know, you know, um, open AI recently announced enhancements to chat GPT to allow it to recognize language, speak language. Spotify is talking about doing translation now of podcasts. So like Dak Shepard, you can listen to him in Spanish and it's with his voice. So you know, the speed with which innovation is happening is breathtaking. You know, ChatGPT also mentioned image recognition uh, is finally being incorporated into their pro accounts. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk about one other use case from the Associated Press real quick, which is a news leader use case. So most of the use cases that we'll probably end up talking about and that the AP um, uh, was piloting are me really replacing tasks that a reporter does. Um, but what I found really interesting was their most ambitious product project, which uh, was a project um, for a um, known as an assignment editor. So, you know, back in my Miami Herald days, I would walk in every morning and there was Mindy Marquez um, and she was sitting, you know, in the most prominent seat in the newsroom and she was the assignment editor. And Mindy would basically say, Dan, go cover this. Um, and uh, I would run out and cover it. And, and you know, in a, whether you're in a newspaper or in a local TV station, the assignment editor is like a really uh, authoritative and hallowed person. And that poor person is just being inundated by pitches. 
hundreds and hundreds of pitches an hour and, and, and they're overwhelmed constantly. And so very important things. Uh, it's like a rushing river and, you know, fish are swimming by all the time. Uh, and so could we create a system to go through mail and flag the important ones and automatically build them into the coverage calendar? So, for instance, the mayor's office releases a press release, you know, a, uh, a press release about an upcoming press conference. You know, we that we know we're going to go. So let's just go ahead and populate and staff that. So they built they tried to build a system uh, to do just that from uh, WFMZ TV, uh, a television station in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it was really di difficult. Like uh, in the end the system was only able to classify 20% emails that came in and the other 80% still have to be manually reviewed. But they did save one hour a day on a task that takes six hours a day. So instead of it taking six hours, now it takes five. So on some level of failure, right? Like not, not a failure, but it's like a mitigate, you know, qualified success is only 20% are they able to interpret but on the other hand, you're saving that person five hours a week. So uh, it, it, it was an interesting one. But anybody who's been in, a, in an assignment editor role, you know, discerning the news um, and then programming. So what's interesting also about that one is every news station has every news local news outlet has different ways to determine if something is newsworthy, and that's actually part of the sauce. And so in this case, they're not going to share that algorithm that they built to determine if something was newsworthy because they consider that proprietary. So the system can work, but each of the news um, outlets are going to have to program it themselves. And the way they do it is they went through thousands of emails and said, yes, newsworthy, not newsworthy. They built a neural network and, 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 and that's how they were able to figure that out. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of the, 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 one of the things that stood out for me uh, was also both in that example and in a couple of the others, um, they made a point of saying, look, this is not a set it and forget it. This is not let the AI run that there's, there's, there's this real interaction with the human and a human verifying and checking and being a part of the process, um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we use all, you know, as we dig into all of these tools. Yeah, the term they call it is human in the loop. Human in the loop. So the idea of automation is that the computer does automated things, and this is this is these are all examples of AI enhanced automation. So automation uh, is really about data being transitioned and transferred into different formats. Uh, intelligent automation or AI enhanced automation is leveraging AI to make that stuff more valuable. And what they said is that every key step in the process needed a human in the loop and every mistake that was published was because a human wasn't in the loop. Hmm. And so this goes back to the main theme that I talk about in my training, which is it's not about humans getting replaced by machines. It's about the human AI partner. We have to become cyborgs. We have to become able to work with the machines to do more work better. But what's really interesting is they definitely could not, if they, even if they had tried, get rid of humans, even if it's to debug the software or to edit the output. And one of the things I have said, and I think is going to be more and more true, is we're going from writers to editors. We're going from coders to debuggers. Absolutely. Were there any other takeaways that you got out of that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the I think the um, this is going to be a little bit wonky, but here goes. There is a way you build software that's called Scrum, and Scrum is about short sprints and building like little mini deliverables and then iterating on it. Um, and the motto of Scrum is twice the work in half the time. And the Scrum methodology, what's known as an agile methodology, has become the way that all 
software is built uh, and it re replaced what used to be called waterfall where you would work in a closet for years and then boom release the software in this case you're releasing something every week or every other week and one of the things i so saw i'm scrum certified in the marketing consulting that i do and one of the biggest ahas from scrum is that they spend an equal amount of time not doing the work but but optimizing how the work is getting done right so in other words it's not about the work the, the, the magic of Scrum is about the conversations about how the work is done that actually lead to levels of efficiency. And it occurred to me listening to this that it is very, very difficult for busy journalists in demanding newsrooms to take the time to think about and work on how they do the work. They spend most of their time doing the work and it fills up every second of their day. And so they were talking, some of the leader, leaders of this project were talking about how difficult it was to find the work on these projects. Because these all are projects about how the work is getting done, and they're not actually doing the work. This is a huge problem for journalists. Because what's happening is, as social media is putting more demands on us publishing to multiple platforms and more quickly, as copy editors and paginators are being let go and now reporters have to write headlines and cut lines and maybe even take their own photos and video the doing of the work is filling more we're being asked to do more and it's filling an increasingly large amount of our time and brain space and it wasn't like we were not doing a lot back in the day and so this I don't think almost any journalist really has time to think about how the work is getting done and how to do it more efficiently, which is very common in business and in software. Like we're thinking all the time about how to do things more efficiently. So I think we're in trouble uh, as a as an industry because we need to develop a discipline that is very foreign to us where it's not about the the, the articles published but the work behind getting those articles published and how to do that more efficiently. And at the heart of AI enhanced automation and everything the Associated Press is working on in its local news initiative is about getting the work done more efficiently. And it's very foreign and difficult for journalists to do. And I, I think to me, that is a risky thing for the industry. And hopefully that leads to more impact and not just more efficiency. So I want, I want to dig into this just a little bit because, as you know, I have a software background and went from Waterfall to Agile, also Scrum certified. And, um, you know, I know you've applied this in your own business, but one of the things that is really powerful about some of these Agile methodologies is it's not just about efficiency and getting more done. It's also about effectiveness, which in journalism would be about impact. So a couple, a couple ways that manifest itself in a scrum, the scrum world is you have these cycles, so you have a rhythm. It's not sort of a constant pace. You take time to, uh, to debrief, uh, to look back at what worked and what didn't every two weeks, a typical cycle. You take time to plan, and you have a limit to your work in progress. So you're not just trying to do more, more, more. Uh, you're trying to get at a sustainable pace and get better at it. And you're always measuring yourself uh, in a software environment by, is this meeting the client's need? Is this resulting in growth? In journalism, we, you know, you translate that to impact. And I think as we think about what AI is going to enable and the work it's going to save, we want that to be more of the paradigm and not what email did for business, which took a lot of friction out, made communication more efficient, but it didn't make our life better, <laughs> e easier, or even that much more effective. It just ginned up the rat race. And so I think if AI could go either way. So if we're using it smartly um, and evaluating what we're doing, I think it has the real potential to let us have more impact and more sustainable lives as journalists. Uh, and if we don't, it'll just be like email where we've just got more and more and more to do. You're, you know, Tim, you're pointing to something really profound, which is it really matters a lot what you're automating and where you're looking to find time savings. What I love about these projects is every single one of them were doing a mission critical or life-saving 
summarization or automation and things that all of them consider essential to serving their public and that they know their public wants. So whether it's alerts about upcoming hurricanes or summarization of the local town hall meetings or uh, police blotter items, all of these are essential duties of local journalists and local media outlets. And all of them have been endangered by the industry struggles and the cutting of staff and the lack of newsroom people. So when you're thinking about automation in your local news outlet, make sure you're automating the stuff that will make a huge difference to your audience and any repetitive tasks that are high value to your audience, but don't really require human intelligence or, you know, human to human intelligence or data gathering, or um, really a lot of discernment from the reporter. Um, there are always in every job some mundane tasks. Um, and so the more that you can find high value to your high value um, to your audience, but low value provided by the reporter tasks, that's a good task that's eligible for automation. Great. So I would like to move into to some, some different use cases. Uh, so what the AP has been investing in helping newsrooms with a, practical uses of AI for a while. And the, the webinar they just gave highlighted examples of particularly automation, right? And custom development uh, that they helped facilitate. Um, but there are, of course, uh, a, lot of, a lot of other use cases. And OpenAI has uh, given some funding to the American Journalism Project to develop some some new ideas they've uh paid ap actually for their content uh which is great um but there are a lot of use cases that don't require custom development uh the tools that are out there and and maybe more importantly the tools that will be coming can provide a lot of value uh, so i'd like to spend a minute just kind of talking about um, those other use cases and those other tools uh, on the business side, there's some obvious things that businesses are doing right now that you've taught people about. So there's, you know, from a audience development, audience growth standpoint, there's all kinds of optimizations and tools around SEO, um, SEM, uh, in tweaking advertising, delivering ads, um, and, you know, sales research. We had someone speak at our conference last year about uh, last week, last month, sorry, uh, about how he's using just a, you know, chat GPT to help him prepare for uh, sales calls and getting ideas for what the client might, uh, might need and might, he might think about that maybe wasn't, you know, obvious to him to begin with. Um, and I think a lot of that could apply to reporting so, um, you know, if you're, if you're working on a story, chat GPT can be a partner. Uh, it can be like an intern or an assistant to help you think through some things. Uh, and, and, and I know that's a little bit of how you talk about with marketing professionals and how they can use these tools. And I think there's some obvious applications um, to a reporter uh, going in to approach a story. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think when you're thinking about how to use automation, whether you're a reporter or a newsroom leader, the AP examples are going to be out of reach for most news organizations, unless you have pretty sophisticated support systems and developers and so forth. But there's like a million ways that you as a reporter uh, can use this in very simple ways using free or very low cost tools like ChatGPT. Um, and there were a couple that I thought were really exciting. I think one of the cool ways to use it, and I don't know how ethical this is, uh, but is to take your raw notes from like a phone conversation or a series of phone conversations and have ChatGPT write it into a Associated Press style inverted pyramid article. Or to take the lead from what you know, the lead is the first paragraph or a couple of paragraphs of your article 
and rewrite it. Or to take language that maybe you borrowed from another publication um, and you don't want to use the same words because that would be a copyright infringement and just have it rewrite those words to mean the same thing using different language. All of those are ways to enhance the quality of your, your, the, your copy, get you at least a rough draft of, a, of a, an article. Uh, another example is if you are a foreign born person working as a journalist in the United States and your English, written English isn't that fluent, you can use this to help clean up your language. And I know a lot of you know, foreign PhDs have benefited enormously from being able to use ChatGPT to help them write research papers. So it can help level the playing field a little bit. When I was a journalist, a lot of journalists were good journalists and not good writers. It seems to me that if you use this tool effectively, you should become a better writer. You're not going to become, you know, the, the beautiful, florid style of, you know, a Rick Bragg, but at least you can get your uh, up, upgrade your writing to a better level. So from a writing perspective, this could be an incredibly powerful tool. Just be really, really careful that the data, that the, that the stories you're writing are accurate to what actually happened. But if you did the reporting, it should be very easy to see areas where there's hallucination or making things up and, and to correct for those. So that's one area that I'm really excited about that is, uh, I think, has an immediate use for many journalists. Absolutely. And I want to categorize some, some ways to maybe think about the, the different ways you could use it. But maybe first, let's talk a little bit about approaches to the tools that are out there, in particular, ChatGPT. Um, so, you know, one I, I gave a talk last week, actually, to a group of, of business people and, and gave them several suggestions. So first, like get the paid version. It's $20 a month and it is so much better than 3.5 uh, in a, a round table that you facilitated in Colorado. We saw that live where we ask a question. We were in the 3.5 by default and it was very stilted um, and robotic sounding. And then we did the same question in four and it had uh, a lot more style and fluidity to it. Um, so, so definitely, you know, upgrade, pay for it. Um, and don't use it like Google. This is treat it like a, an intern, have a conversation, ask advice, uh, have a back and forth, give it some, some, um, some goals and some structure. Anything you would add to that? Yeah. Well, you know, to your point, uh, I'm really excited about the idea of, uh, using this to help with interview app. So um, I'd love to, to chat a little bit about that. Um, so, you know, one of the hardest things when you're, you know, preparing for an interview is to um, think up creative questions. And so you could feed into ChatGPT or a tool like it background information that you've gathered about your interview subject you could even feed into them a list of the questions you've thought up and then you could invite them to think up other questions or creative questions or questions you hadn't thought of or questions nobody's thought of asking. So brainstorming interview questions, I think is a very exciting use case. You could also say, ask ChatGPT to take on the persona of the interview subject. And as long as they're public, a public figure, they could actually conduct the interview with you. You could say, you are Taylor Swift. I am going to interview you now. Let's go. You know, where were you born? And, and you can actually uh, practice interview uh, using a chat uh, as well. I, I think um, one of the, you know, I, I used to teach um, interviewing as a skill and I called questions precision instruments. Hmm. And so this is giving you more tools to get out of them uh, information they've never shared before, unexpected questions. I, you know, uh, Terry Gross, um, if you ever listen to a Terry Gross interview, her, her, her methodology is really simple. Terry is famous for preparing like mad for her interviews. And so she would read every book they'd written, you know, every interview they'd ever given. <clears throat> and then in the interview, if you listen, she'll summarize what they've said in the past and then ask the follow-up question that nobody had thought to ask. So ChatGPT 
can be like, but you know, Terry Gross had no life. Like every day, you know, she would leave work and spend all night reading in preparation. So ChatGPT is really good at doing that kind of thing, reading stuff fast and ingesting it. So I could imagine a world where you could have like a question generator where you're, you could say to it, what is a question that this celebrity or this person has never been asked before in any publication? Yeah. And, you know, Im embedded in some of what you're saying, there are some other th advice for using something like a chat GPT. One, you can give it as a you can give it a role so you can say act as you know, my subject or act as my editor or act as my financial advisor or my, my, uh, you know, marketing guru and help me optimize this. Um, you can, you know, ask it for a tone. So you tell it to be formal or casual or informative or persuasive or humorous. Uh, you can ask for a format, uh, Q and a outline bullet points, form of a script, give it a purpose, tell it who your audience is. And you can also, uh, tell it how to respond in the style of, or in a certain structure. Um, so, you know, th those are just little practical tips as you're using it. Um, uh, anything else you would add, um, uh, you know, from, from your master class and just general tips on using a tool like chat GPT. Yeah, a couple little tidbits that I learned by listening to some prompt engineers talk about how they what they've learned. So one of the most surprising is if you tell ChatGPT to take a deep breath and then do a task, it will do it better than if you don't. Now, why this works, nobody really fully understands. <laughs> uh, we know humans do better when they take a deep breath. But if you're not getting a good response, you can try that. Uh, it's kind of a crazy one. Another one that's really interesting is um, if you want them to kind of build out like a step-by-step -step process, because a lot of times, uh, you know, human beings and, and, and robots skip steps when they're explaining things. So you say, if you tell it just start your answer with the word first comma, it will do a better job uh, of giving you step-by-step -step instructions. So there's a lot of little tricks. Um, one of the things that's a little bit um, challenging is as the models get better and they learn and learn, a lot of what worked uh, works now or really helps it now uh, will, will not be needed in the future. So pro what, what these tricks of the trade of prompt engineering or writing effective prompts are going to evolve with time. One other kind of really important point that I want to make is if you give ChatGPT or a tool like it the exact same information to work from and the exact same prompt, it will give you a different answer every time. And yeah. so one of the things that I highly recommend is the regenerate and let it give you versions. Even if you like a version, you might as well go ahead and regenerate and get a second or a third. It might even ask you which version do you like better. This is a really important tip because you shouldn't ever, if it's really important, you shouldn't just be satisfied with the first. You can do it for the second. So you can send them, like if 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 they're off, if they're if their response is off, and you weren't specific, you can refine the query. But if your query was good and the response is still off, rather than giving up, just regenerate, and the second response might be better than the first. Um, I do this all the time now, um, and what you'll see is when you hit regenerate in ChatGPT, it'll just say one of two, two of two, you know, and and then you can cycle through the versions. Great. Well, in the few minutes we got left, I just want to tease people with some other ideas that some of which you and I have discussed and then see if you want to add anything. So we talked a, a little, little bit about using it for research and preparation for a story or an interview. Uh, and that's where having a conversation with it could be really helpful. Content creation and editing. I really love your idea of just throwing notes and see what you get back. Um, Transcribing interviews, we've talked about AI assisted writing, copy editing. One of the areas that I think has the most promise is in data and document analysis. Uh, so, whether you're trying to do something as simple as manipulate a spreadsheet and do pivot tables and you need some help or some new, maybe some new ideas for things to notice, or you're going to throw PDFs at it uh, and have it uh, do some crunching, I think it can really supercharge that. Um, 
even things like have it generate a freedom of information request for you and do that in bulk uh, could really be helpful. Translation, we've talked about that. Um, and then just in, in the more conversational um, t pattern with ChatGPT, I think you could really use it to dig into find patterns, spot malfeasance, combat disinformation, um, and you know, I think it'll become a real tool in some of the automations too, and particularly around mis and disinformation. Uh, and then you could also use it to build chatbots uh, for your audience. We were, I think I've talk, told you that we're looking at building one uh, for the Freedom of Information Coalition, where we'll upload it, best practices documents, maybe some court cases, and people can, can go in there and chat with, here's the response I'm getting from, from this government entity. What are my rights? How should I respond? What else can I do? Are they right about this matter of law? And it's, you know, not always going to be 100% accurate, but I think it's going to be a lot closer than whatever we, however we're doing it now for the most part. Yeah. One other really huge opportunity is computer-assisted reporting using big spreadsheets of data. So one of the things that really held a lot of us back from doing data, uh, data-based reporting, uh, as computer-assisted reporting, is that we don't know SQL or we don't know how to query the data. And we are now at a place where you can use natural language querying. You don't need to use SQL or another programming language to ask the spreadsheet for insights and information. You can. There's actually a, a, a function inside of ChatGPT. It's a lab function where you can upload a CSV of data uh, and it does advanced data analysis. And you can even say, so you can ask it like, okay, you know, here's a list of data. You know, please let me know, you know, what the average uh, salary for this group of employees was. But you can also say you are an HR manager and you're doing it, preparing a presentation to your boss uh, about the data set here. What queries would you recommend that we make of the data and then please present to me that data and then visualize it and it can do that it's quite yeah. extraordinary um, what this does is it allows all of us to become data-driven reporters and computer-assisted reporters and you know back in the day there were entire conferences NICAR and uh, you know entire dedicated uh, people who were the like computer assisted reporter and they were always oversubscribed. They always had a long list of people they were waiting for to help. Now you can do that yourself and there's really very little stopping you. You do not need to be able to code. Uh, all you just need is a structured data set and the CSV file and you can do this yourself. And this kind of functionality is gonna soon be built into Excel and Google Sheets through Google's Duet and Microsoft's Copilot. So you aren't even gonna need to uh, go outside of the spreadsheet themselves. The spreadsheets themselves will become natural language queryable, and that is a game changer for computer-assisted reporting. Absolutely. Well, One other we thing I want to mention of... is uh, I know we're out of time, but really quickly, um, the other thing that's been really uh, difficult is how do we use image generating software like Dali or Midjourney. And my recommendation there is it's, I don't think it's going to be appropriate to use it to create photorealistic images, but there's no reason you can't use a Dolly 3, which just got released, or a Midjourney to create cartoon or illustrations. And so I think another opportunity that journalists could do is to use it as an illustrator and then touch it up in Photoshop. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dan, for your time. Hopefully this has prompted a lot of ideas for people. And uh, no I, look forward to, yeah. <laughs> and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll be your first three-time guest as well. <laughs> All right. Bye.